Wall tubers, Jeff here. Hey, I've been wanting to put this video together for some time. Uh, some of you have been asking about the go-kart and if I could get a video up on more of the details of the build of wall subs. And that's what we're going to go after here. Let's start with the hydraulic clutch setup. I'll get the little. I utilize the hydraulic master cylinder off the motorcycle handlebars. There's a cap where you fill the reservoir. Okay, come around here and there's a turnbuckle adjustment to fine tune it. And in this shot here you can see where I cut that hand lever off. Then I added a rubber pedal stop for the final touch. Now you can see them two wires there that are on from the clutch pedal for the safety. Got the key on on, you got a neutral light right there. It's not in here. Yep, it starts right up. Okay, now what the two wires are for on that clutch pedal. Okay, we're gonna put it in gear here. And of course, yeah, now it won't start because the neutral light ain't on. Well, I don't like to, every time you stall a motor, you don't want to take it out of gear, put it in neutral to start the motor, and then put it back in gear. So what that the wires are for on that switch there, you can just push the clutch in. And it'll start up in gear, but you gotta have the clutch in. Kind of a neat little safety feature. Now some of the things on here have uh, homemade swivels. You can see that angle iron there. And pivot for that clutch pedal with a little arm welded on the side. Well, let's move on to the shifter and you will see a similar design there. Two pieces of angle iron with a piece of round rod for the arm for the shifter and that's how that works. So if we come back to the rear here, we've got a turnbuckle there to adjust the length for the shifter and one retainer there. So don't flex, and one more back there. And in the back there, the shift rod comes around through, and because of the angle it was on, it would actually flex quite a bit right there. So we put a little extra structural on it, and that was the shifter uh, for your foot on the motorcycle. And of course, it used to be mounted this way, and now we mounted it vertically, cut it off, and put a pivot on for that arm. That's how it works. A little white knob there. That's for the choke. The choke cable comes around, up, and catches on a bracket right here. And then, of course, there's your swivel, which controls all four carburetors. Now, one thing, a little trivia for you here, too, is these motorcycle motors ain't made to run in uh, zero or ten below or whatever. I did modify where they have jet choke, not a butterfly choke. I did modify them slightly. Uh, makes it start real easy. When it's real cold out, when you want to drive around the ice. Yeah, let's move on to the gas pedal. A lot of these parts here were parts that I had from uh, vehicles that I saved upstairs and we just utilized them on the go-kart. You want a lot of pedal travel, so it's easier to control when you're going over rough terrain. And a pedal stop is always a good idea to have too. Here's a quick look from the top view. Note the rubber boot where the cable goes into the housing. It keeps water out to keep the cable from freezing in the wintertime. The cable comes around the back side of the motor and hooks onto the throttle spool. An adjustment there in case you want to fine tune it and one additional return spring. Here's a little tip for you, tours. If you gotta make some cables that are a little longer than normal, all you can do is buy your cable housing and the cable itself and get some old motorcycle cables. Pop the ends off, you got a nice adjuster here. Get it exactly where you want it and put that on the end of your cable. Let's move on to the fuel tanks. Normally these fuel tanks have a vented cap on them. For venting and overflow, what I've done is drill a couple holes in the tank, put some 8 inch copper tubing down and around, and that runs down underneath the cart now. 
British tank has a shut off underneath here, which you can reach while you're in the driver's seat. That way, you never have to worry about running out of gas. The fuel line comes up behind the seat. I have a cushion clip there to keep it from rubbing on the shift rod. And right behind the seat here is where the fuel pump hides out. Using a car fuel injection fuel filter, which does a much better job at keeping the fine debris out of the carburetor bowls. The electric fuel pump on this engine only gets one pulse per engine revolution, which is for safety reasons. The prime button is to quickly fill the carburetor bowls if it's been sitting for some time. Behind the seat and above the fuel pump in the little tray is the engine run computer. It controls timing advance and the four ignition coils. The battery box is all rubber isolated and the bolts there are drilled and tapped into the frame. The starter solenoid had a really nice little rubber hanger on it, so I made up a bracket for that and welded that on the battery box too. Here's the engine oil cooler, which is a cut down AC condenser off of a car. Let's see how the cooling system works here. That would be the water pump. The lower hose is the one from the water pump. Comes around, goes to the lower spigot on the radiator. This does have a cooling fan on the radiator. There is your temp sensor that triggers it. About the only time the fan ever turns on is when you get this thing stuck. Shot it up a radiator hose. That would be the top one on the frame there. Comes up and goes into the thermostat housing. So you get the air out of the cooling system when you fill it. You crack the hose loose back by the thermostat housing and I relocated the radiator neck up high in the front here. And there's your coolant recovery box. Hey tubers, I got a neat little trick here for you. You ever notice how fast oil pressure gauge responds on the go-kart? And it's an electric one. This is a neat little trick I've been doing for years to make an electric gauge respond as fast as a mechanical one with a quarter inch copper line going to it. Yeah, you get that piece of wire out of there that they use for an orifice and then you drill that hole out the eighth inch. Just be careful so you don't drill in too far and hit the diaphragm. It would be just past that hex head there. Moving along here, let's get to the steering. The steering wheel has been mounted on a hub, which has been welded to a set collar. For shaft support, I have a bearing block. And down at the end, the rag joint was from a Chevrolet Nova. Rack and pinion, that came from a 76 MG midget. Fuse box? That was from a motorcycle. It's nice when things are made to be easily serviced. For the dashboard, you can remove them screws on the front. And on the back side here, you disconnect some connectors. Remove the speedometer cable, and the dash would be in your hand. Well, where the speedometer was from a motorcycle, normally the cable would have went straight down instead of towards the front there. So I had to get a 90 degree angle box. The cable was from a Chevrolet truck. It needed to be a real long one where it had so far to go. Back here there's a coupler where it goes to the last little section which goes on to the rear drive sprocket. I'm driving the cable off the bolt that holds the sprocket on. I welded a little square piece on the bolt head which the cable slides into. Well, here's a little sneak peek on what's coming up for part two. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video, and thank you so much for stopping by my channel. Hope to catch you again. Bye-bye.